Rachel Baskin, thank you for joining us in Marcy's Law interview series, Why We Do What We Do. Thank you for having me. I, I want to, um, first of all, introduce you as um, a person who is a, a follow-up to our last Why We Do What We Do interview with uh, Fresno County District Attorney Lisa Smithcamp. Uh, Lisa told an incredible story, told a lot about her career and talked about some of her cases and highlighted one that really she thought embodied everything it was to become a prosecutor. Um, and meeting you and following your career path was one of the biggest honors of her life. Um, after, after that interview, I talked to Lisa and asked her if there's any way that we could get you on as well. And so I really appreciate you taking the time to join oh, us. Thank you, I'm honored. <laughs> so you are a deputy district attorney in Fresno County uh, yeah. under district attorney uh, Lisa Smithcamp. Yes. And you are also a single mom. Yes. While working as a deputy district attorney. And we all know it's back to school time, sadly enough. And yes. <laughs> you are a single mom of a 15 year old daughter who yes. is getting ready to go back to school, with back to school shopping, and all that goes along with that. Oh, yes. Yeah. She starts next week. So a little bit of butterflies and excitement. <laughs> now, that that story is enough uh, for a lot of people to relate to as far as the challenges of that particular lifestyle goes. Yeah. Um, but your story is unique on a whole lot of levels. And it's a real triumph over tragedy story. And I want to bring everybody back um, to a date of, Ju of July 16th. 2009, uh, which was a date that changed your life forever. Um, and to, in order for people to understand how your tragedy turned into triumph and to, and to develop this entire story arc, um, I want to bring you back even further than July 16, 2009, the date that changed your life forever, to 2004, when you met a man who later became your husband, a man named Dijon Baskin. Yes. Now, uh, when you first met, you described, uh, you told me that uh, he looked like, and, and you, you described him as your Prince Charming. Yes, uh, when I first met uh, my ex-husband, he, um, that was back in 2004. Um, I was almost 20 uh, years old, um, and he was the quintessential uh, Prince Charming. He was very uh, loving towards me, very, um, respectful, very uplifting, um, basically made me feel like this was my soulmate, this was my partner um, in life. Um, and so we ended up getting married about a year and three months later after, after meeting him in 2004. And after you got married, uh, you described that your relationship changed dramatically and it was more of a Jekyll and Hyde type situation where um, Dijon became incredibly controlling of you and you felt very isolated as a result. Yes. So in the beginning, he, he was in the military. So it was mostly a long distance relationship. Um, we ended up getting married and he re-enlisted and then um, enlisted uh, or got moved from North Carolina to San Diego, California. Um, and so we got married with the idea that I would move down to San Diego and um, we would, uh, you know, live our lives together as a married couple. Um, he ended up, I ended up not moving down. I stayed where I was uh, located. And um, he just, uh, we, we got married and things were fine in the beginning. And then probably about six months into our marriage is when he kind of started revealing his true self and, and basically made no efforts to hide it at that point. Um, he kind of said, oh, you know, this is who you really married. Um, and he would do things like isolate me. Um, he would start to kind of break me down, break my, you know, confidence down and talk about how everybody, you know, I let everybody walk all over me. And, um, he would also, I'm, you know, six hours away from where he was at. And he would tell me, oh, I don't want you, you can't go to the store at night. Um, it's dangerous. I don't want you, you know, to get hurt. Um, I don't want you going here and there. And, or hanging out with your friends, going out with your friends. It, it, he made it in like such a convincing way where, you know, a, it was a concern of his for my safety or concern that something would happen or this and that. And 
you know, I, at the time I didn't see it as being controlling. I just thought, oh, he's, you know, concerned for me and he's concerned for me because he loves me. And so now looking back on it, you know, I realized that was complete control over any little aspect of my life that he could at the time when, um, you know, I was farther away from him and, and wasn't living with him at that time. So. And as, and as the months went on, you became more controlled, more isolated and suffered from what you, what you described as um, um, a lot of uh, domestic emotional abuse um, and your relationship um, uh, for better or worse, broke down. Yes. And um, at, at the same time, while this was happening, uh, you found out in March of 2007 uh, that you were pregnant. Yes. Yeah. So um, I actually found out we had kind of come to the agreement that we weren't, we were going to separate. Um, and just given the circumstances that had transpired uh, before that, um, we were going to separate. And then we kind of came back together and reconciled and then that's when I found out that literally within that week is when I found out that I was expecting my daughter um, and that was the day that I found out he actually was um, being uh, sent out to Iraq uh, to do a tour in Iraq so he was gone the entire um, pregnancy. And so he came back sometime in October of 2007 and your, um, and your baby turned out to be a baby girl, was yes. born on, was it November, November the 8th of 2008? November 8th, yes. And shortly after that, um, in February of 2008, you and your baby girl moved down to be with Dijon in San Diego? Yes, so we ended up, um, when she was about three or four months old, we um, moved down to San Diego. Um, we got an apartment together um, and at that time we were there, you know, I was there with him 24 seven. So then I really got to see, you know, the true side of him. And also that was the time where I wasn't, I didn't go back to work um, at that time. Prior to that, I had been, you know, financially stable on my own. And so um, when I moved in with him, I was taking care of our daughter and I would take him to work, to and from work. Um, and I would clean and cook and, and do everything. And I really got to see who he, who he really was. And it, it got even worse. The isolation was worse. Um, he would uh, say things, he broke me down emotionally. I mean, my, my self-esteem was below, <laughs> below the ground. Um, and so he would, and then financially he would say, you know, I make all the money. You should be grateful that I'm paying all of your bills and, you know, basically I had to do everything he said, cook and clean. And, you know, he would, I would clean the house and he'd get home and he'd make a mess and destroy the house. And then I had to clean it up. And it was just this repeated cycle. Um, and then he also started interfering with, um, you know, me doing activities with my daughter, even taking her to the beach or um, in, to take her photographs or anything. And it was every time I would mention it to him, like, you know, as I'm dropping him off, I would say, oh, I, you know, I'm going to go and take Layla to the beach today. And he would immediately, what, where, whatever I said I was doing, he would always interrupt that and say, oh, you can't do that. I need you to pick me up for lunch and I, or I need you to take me here or I need you to do this. And um, then it became, you know, apparent that, that he didn't want me to be involved in our daughter's life that he wasn't able to be involved. So everything he would say, oh no, do that. Let's do that on the weekend when I can be a part of it. And then he would never, the weekend would come and he would never try to do it. And I'm like, well, hey, you said we were gonna go to the beach or we were gonna go take photos or, you know, and he would say, oh no, we'll do it next weekend, next weekend. And it just, it, it was just to make sure that I wasn't able to do that with her by myself. And the reason why you weren't working outside of the home is because you were raising your baby girl. Yes. Yeah. So at that point, I didn't have any daycare because my family's not from San Diego where we were. So we didn't have anybody. And so he and at the, that point, I had said, you know, I can go back to work. But he even made comments of, well, who's going to cook for me and my friends when my friends come over? You know, if you're working, then I have to take care of our daughter. And, you know, <laughs> I wasn't able to be in his beck and call. So, And, it, and at some point, uh, despite the fact that your confidence had been so totally shattered, as you said, you, you made a decision for yourself and for your baby girl. And you said, I don't want 
this baby girl of mine to grow up in a in a surround in some surroundings where she thinks this is what love actually looks like. And so you yes. decided to take your baby girl, move back to um, where you would come from. And was it Reedley, California at the time? Yes. At that time, um, I moved back in with my brother who had a house out in Reedley. And so that was February of 2009. Um, and, um, and oh, I'm sorry, it was August of 08 that you had yes. moved back to Reedley. Um, and then you said that, um, let's, let's now go to uh, February of 2009, when you found out something else about Dijon that he um, was having an affair. Yes, yeah, so um, when I moved back in um, August of 2008, um, back home, um, I ended up, I um, enrolled into uh, Fresno City College and I was in the paralegal program. Um, and my goal was to, you know, continue my education and get a job and, and be supportive or self-supportive. Um, and at that time I was still married and my ex-husband um, wanted to work on our marriage. And so he was willing to go to counseling and I noticed the change in him was he was actually being nice <laughs> to me and he was, you know, very attentive and, oh, let's take, you know, Layla to, or my daughter to um, uh, the zoo and let's take her to Disneyland and let's take her here and there. And so he would, he all of a sudden wanted to do the things that I had been begging him to do with us for, you know, months prior. Um, and so in February of 2009, I found out that he was actually having an affair with another Marine that was on the base. Um, and so at that point, I, when I found out, I confronted him, I ended up, he, he confessed to everything after I brought him the evidence. And um, at that point, I initiated a divorce. And I said, you know, I can't do this. I, I'm done. <laughs> yeah. And then a after that, after the divorce proceedings were initiated, and you went back and forth with, um, uh, with Dijon and his attorney, there was some custody issues, some child support disputes, and you went back and forth. Um, and, um, and, and at some point in July of 2009, one of those uh, one of those disagreements was occurring on the phone relative to um, relative to s some kind of dispute around the divorce. Um, and without getting into the details of it, on July 15th of 2009, at around uh, in at, at some point, you had had a, a, an argument. And then at seven o'clock or so later on in that evening, you had an, a nice almost reconciliation conversation, um, more friendly conversation with Dijon. Tell us a little bit about how that went on the evening of July 15th, 2009. Yes, um, so we had already been to court. I had, um, he wasn't responding to any of the court documents um, or showing up to court or having anybody represent him. Um, so the judge ended up making a finding for a support order um, he got notice of that. We were arguing back and forth about um, money and he was pissed off about the order that, um, you know, he had to pay. And I told him, you know, it was almost $2,200 in the support order monthly um, that I was awarded. And I told him, I don't need $2,200 a month. So I had agreed um, prior to that. I was like, let's just do, if you give me 500, you know, that would be enough for me to, you know, sustain my life as I'm, you know, uh, working for myself and then also um, taking care of Layla and, and um, you know, getting everything that she needs. Um, and so he said, that's fine, but he was never following through with that. And so the, on July 15th, we had this argument over the phone um, and I'm like, you know, just, you're saying you're going to do it and then you don't do it. So we need to finalize the divorce, you know, and, and try to settle that. And I had told him, you know, you're moving on with your life. You have a girlfriend you're, he, he had just moved in with her. And I said, you're, you're doing good with your life. You're moving on. I would like to move on too. And so it was this big argument. Um, and then later on, so we hang up and then later on in the evening, he calls me back and, you know, he apologizes. I apologize. Um, he says, you know, I'll send you the 500. I'll get the divorce paperwork finalized and, and we'll work this out. It's fine. You know, let's, let's stop doing this. And so he's being super nice. And I even at that night, it was about seven o'clock at night um, on the 15th. 
um, he said that he was going to make his girlfriend dinner. And he asked me for the recipe for my green beans that I always used to make. So I gave him the recipe and I'm like, have a good night. And that's how we ended it on July 15th. And not knowing the, that time frame, he, he most likely hung up. And then within an hour, he was driving up from San Diego to Reedley. Okay. So after you hung up the phone, as it turns out, when you turn the calendar back a little bit, it's uh, about how long of a ride is it from San Diego to Reedley? Uh, it's about a six hour drive. Okay. And so now let's, after that conversation that you had, um, let's turn to the next morning. Um, from your perspective, July 16th, 2009, the date that we started talking about at the beginning of this interview that changed your life. Tell yeah. us what happened when you woke up on July 16th, 2009. So um, I woke up and I was getting ready for work. Um, I went to my mom. I woke her up because um, I had clothes in the dryer that I needed for work. Um, so I woke her up and I got the key to the garage door where the washer and dryer was. Um, and so I woke her up, I started heading to the garage door to get my clothes for work. Um, and I go out and I notice that the garage door is open about three inches and it's, you know, not locked, it's open. And I thought that's really weird because I know my mom religiously locks <laughs> all the doors. And so um, I start to push open the door. And when I pushed open the door, I see legs and they're walking towards me. And my initial thought was my brother was, you know, coming home from work at odd hours of the morning. Um, and so I assumed that it was him maybe in the garage for some reason. And so as I'm processing the, there's legs, maybe it's my brother. And I look up, I already had a gun pointed to my head. Um, I, he had a knife in his hand. He had a mask on, a hoodie. Um, this is the middle of summer. So it was, you know, in, it was a, probably a hundred degrees at seven o'clock in the morning. Uh, it gets very hot over here. And he had the gun to my head. He pushes me out of the garage and into the patio. Um, and, you know, he's yelling at me profanities. He's trying to conceal his voice to make it sound like it's not him. Um, but of course I recognize that it's, you know, my ex or my husband at the time. Um, and so I go and I, I grab the, the gun away from me. I grab the barrel, I pull it down and I'm like, what are you doing? What are you doing here? And I'm just trying to process this. Cause in my head, I'm thinking we just ended the, you know, a few hours ago last night, about 12 hours ago. And, you know, we were fine. We apologized. Like we were on a good note. And so my guard was very down at that time. Um, and so my initial thought was, I need to see if my mom is still awake and can get help. So I open up the door to the kitchen and it's the way that the, the kitchen was my mom, actually, it was right by the patio. So I open the door and as I open the door, my mom is right there walking into the kitchen and she sees me and him and I tell her he's here, go get help. And I slam the door and I'm trying to keep him outside because I don't want him to come inside. And so she goes and runs and grabs my brother. Um, I'm wrestling with him outside and he has the knife and the gun. Um, he ends up overpowering me and he gets into the kitchen um, and, you know, he throws me into this. Uh, we had like this little caddy uh, that had like cleaning supplies on it. So I get thrown into that by the time I'm able to pick myself up. Um, I had already been cut a few times in the struggle on my hands and um, he, he, my brother comes in the living room and the kitchen area and my mom was there and he's pointing the gun at them and telling them not to move, not to do anything. And so at that point, he basically told us all to get on the couch and sit down and he put, held us hostage and he kind of was mumbling, going back and forth and saying, you know, he already committed a crime. He's already going to jail. Um, and then he, you know, we're trying to get him out of the house. So we're telling him nobody called the cops, you know, and he's looking out the window constantly thinking that, you know, we called the cops in that time. And, um, you know, we're like, nobody called the cops. You can leave, you need to leave. And he's like, no, I committed a crime already. I, you know, I just, I committed burglary. So I'm already in it. And then he said, I'm going to kill myself. That's why I'm here. I'm going to kill myself. And, you know, he's just like rambling on. And then he goes and um, requests to see my daughter. And now, so he now, takes this. 
Oh, I'm sorry. Now, now if I could just, so one, one of the most horrific aspects of this entire scene um, is what you're about to get into right now. Your daughter, who was 18 months old at the time, was in her bedroom while all yeah. of this stuff was going on. And at that point, uh, Dijon then has the gun and he starts to walk down towards your daughter's room with the three of you? Yes. Yeah, so what he ended next? up, oh, I'm sorry. And tell us what happened next. Okay, um, so he ended up, um, he, I, I was trying to get him to let me go to the bathroom too, because I knew my phone was in the bathroom. Um, and so he, at that time, he went and got me peroxide because I'm telling him I'm bleeding, I need to go to the bathroom as an excuse to let him let me go but he wouldn't. So he ends up bringing me, um, the peroxide and he just has me there on the couch. Um, then he tells us, get, let's get up. I want to go see Layla. So he goes and, and we're following in front of him. Um, he has the gun in his hand. He ends up going into my bedroom where Layla was in her crib. Um, and he leans over to her. He didn't have his mask on. He had already taken it off at that time. Um, he leans over, he has the gun behind his back. And he has us all lined up in the room and I'm just praying to God, please don't let him shoot my daughter. <laughs> and so, uh, so he, he's like talking to her and she's just quiet. She's sitting down in her crib and she's just looking at him. She looks at us and then she just is super quiet. Doesn't say anything, doesn't cry, doesn't do anything. And so um, he says, oh, all right, let's go. And so he goes and he makes us leave. And so I'm thinking, okay, he didn't harm her. She's fine. And I'm just going to leave her in here. And so I, I close the door. I tried to, you know, protect her as much as possible. Um, and so we go back into the living room and he puts us again on the couch. And so we're lined up and it's me, it's me, my brother, and then my mom at the very end. And um, then he's going into how he's going to kill himself. And he wants my brother to write this, uh, his suicide note of who gets what when he dies. And, you know, in that moment, I tried everything. I tried to convince him that, you know, I loved him and, and things were going to work out. I tried to convince him, you know, you're not going to get in trouble. I swear we won't tell anybody. Um, no, nothing worked. And I told him, you can kill me just let my brother and my mom take Layla and you can kill me. You can do whatever you want. And he said, no, no, I've already, everybody's already seen me. I'm already going to go to jail for this, you know? And so he's just convinced of that. And then of course my brother is like, no, take them and then you can kill me. And so everybody was saying, you know, everybody was willing to die for each other. And um, that just honestly pissed him off even more. And so he was like, no, no, um, so he starts loading in the bullets to the gun um, and he's rambling about, you know, why he picked a 22 that it, does, it bounces around, it bounces around in your body and it does more damage. And, you know, he's just saying these off the wall things that I had no clue, you know, about guns or anything. And then he tells my brother to turn up the volume of the TV and then he walks around the couch and he grabs a pillow and he starts to kind of manipulate it on his head and acting like he's going to shoot himself but through a pillow and so he has the pillow up and he's kind of like pointing the gun up so it's you know not going to hit him and then he takes the pillow down and goes and boom he shoots me and I flinch and I ended up in the bullet grazed me right here so I have a scar that goes down like this because I move so quickly and then he, I ended up, you know, I'm grabbing my ear because it's ringing and it's burning and, and I see blood and I'm thinking, you know, oh my God, I just got shot. And so I'm telling him like, you shot me. And he looked at me and he was like, it barely grazed you. <laughs> and in that moment, I'm like, he was mad at that point. I think he thought, oh, well, I just wasted a bullet on you because that didn't work. And so I'm just like in shock and he goes right up to my brother um, and gets him point blank in the head. He shoots him. Um, my brother slumps over and then he, at some point he drops the gun and he starts attacking my mom with the knife. And while I run to the bathroom to go grab my phone. And af after that, um, at some point, Dijon then said for you to get back in there or he was going to kill 
your daughter. Yes, yeah, so I was able, as he was attacking my mom, I ran to go grab my cell phone to try to call 911. Um, and so I can hear him yelling for me to come back, come back. And he ends up telling me, you know, you better get back her or I swear to God, I'll kill her. I will kill her. And so he ends up meeting me in the hallway. It was like one big long hallway. So all the bedrooms and the, and the bathroom were in the hallway. So he ends up meeting me in the bathroom by the hallway and um, I had my phone on me. I don't think he even knew that I had it on me, even though I was holding it. And so he takes me back to the living room and I tell him, okay, you know, I'm coming back. Don't, don't hurt Layla. Like don't, don't do anything. I'm coming back. And so he takes me to the living room and he's behind me at that point. And we're walking up to um, the living room where by the front door. And at that point he pulls back my hair and he cuts my throat um, and my first thought, I mean, everything was going by so slow and just, I'm almost like an outer body experience. And I thought play dead. You know, that was my first thing. The instinct is drop to the ground, play dead. <laughs> and so I dropped to the ground and he ends up stopping. He doesn't attack me at that point. My mom started getting up. And so he goes back to her. So while he's at her and she's, you know, fighting him off. Um, I'm calling 911 on my phone and and trying to get a hold of somebody. I can't. I don't even have the phone to my ear at that point. I'm just thinking. I'm hoping somebody got the call and I'm trying to wipe the blood because I had a BlackBerry, so it had like those fine buttons, so I couldn't even see the screen. And um, I ended up calling 911, and I don't know if I ever got through, but I guess I did afterwards because um, they recorded it, everything. But I kept saying my address because I, I know it's a cell phone. It doesn't pick up like a house phone would. So I'm yelling my address out constantly. And at that point, my husband heard me and he comes over on the other side of the couch where I was down on the ground. And at that point, he got on top of me. The phone is, you know, he throws the phone, but it was still near me. And at that point, he's just on top of me, overpowering me. And he's just sawing on my neck back and forth. I have he cuts me on this side. He cuts me on this side. I have, you know, scars um, that go on my shoulders and even part of my face. There's like little scars from him just, you know, slicing as much as he could. Um, and at that point, he had me on the ground with my head pushed to the ground and he's just sawing on my neck. And so I'm thinking he's going to hit my jugular and I'm going to bleed out. Um, and for, you know, <laughs> as much as, you know, I could say it's, it was God who gave me the strength because I somehow was able to overpower him and I was able to grab, uh, I don't know if you can see how my hand is crooked. So I was able to grab my hand um, in between the knife and my neck and I was able to grab the blade and I use my, both of my hands and I'm literally lifting up him on top of me and I was able to get enough of my legs to be able to kick him off of me and I cut all the tendons in my hands um this is after surgery so this is why my hands are frozen now like that um and so I was able to kick him off of me at that point he then goes back to my mom um, and I'm thinking, you know, the time it seemed like it was hours and really, I guess it was only maybe 15 or 20 minutes that it had been going on. Um, but I'm thinking maybe they, maybe 911 didn't get called. So then I go and I run back to the hallway and, um, I go to my brother's room and I try to grab his cell phone to call. And, um, I remember, um, counting the seconds of like, okay, he's going to notice that I'm gone. And then I have about, you know, 10 seconds before he comes back. So I'm trying to call and I hear like a shuffling and I go and I look through the hallway and I see my brother come over the couch and like onto him and, and he takes him down. My brother takes him down. And then I see my mom run out the front door. So I thought this is my only chance to get Layla out of here. So I run back, I snatch her up, her and her blanket. And I, I snatch her up, I run, my brother's still holding him down. And my brother gets up, we, I get up, you know, we're heading out the door. We ended up scattering. So my mom went to the neighbor's house. Um, my brother went two doors down to the other neighbors. Um, and I just went to the main street and I was just screaming for help. I had my daughter in my hands 
And she was just so calm and wasn't crying, wasn't doing anything. She was just there. And, you know, my, I had a lot of blood loss. Um, I had a lot, my, um, my windpipe was severed as well. So every time, you know, I, I breathed or said anything, it was just spraying blood. So she ended up, she was covered in my blood and it looked like she was injured too. And at, the, at that point, um, a, a man pulled up in a, in a truck and saw you distressed on the side of the road. And like you said, there was blood everywhere. Your daughter was covered in your blood. Um, you jumped in the truck and he called the police Yes. as well and took you to a gas station. And then at some point um, you, you had said that there was just police and sheriffs and, and, uh, and law enforcement everywhere. Yes. Yeah. By the time he picked me up, um, I, I, he rolled down the window. I got to see first signs of what I looked like, which, you know, was horrific. Um, and he ended up, he saw my ex-husband, um, in the middle of the street coming out of the house, um, and starting to walk down the street. And so he tells me, get in, get in. So I get in with my daughter and he starts driving down and he's calling 911 and he's telling them, I got her, you know, I have her and her daughter, um, I don't see anybody else, but I see him in the middle of the street. And then he takes me up to the gas station. And at that moment, I, I just saw from every angle, there were um, uh, Reedley PD, there were sheriffs, everybody was coming, ambulance, they were all coming at the same time. And so he ended up um, turning around and, and taking me down a few blocks to where it happened. And so needless to say, he, uh, Dijon was caught right away. And you were, you, you have described to me when you and I've talked about this, um, yeah. how you were med flighted to the hospital and you were, um, you were put in a medically induced uh, coma for a couple yeah. of days. And then when you came to, um, your memory is that there were investigators everywhere and everyone was trying to get to the bottom of this. And yes. um, ultimately the story that you just relayed to us um, um, was um, was available for investigators, and you then um, ended up having to go and take on a whole new chapter of your life that we see with victims, and you now as a deputy district attorney see um, victims don't sign up for this, and yeah. this is usually a new, an entirely new landscape, and very very intimidating uh, for yeah. them to navigate, um, let alone traumatic after what had happened to you. And just, just as a side note, um, the miraculous part of, one of the miraculous parts of all of it is that you survived, like you said, your windpipe and, uh, was, was severed. Same with your mom and same with your brother. All three of you, uh, thank God, survived. Yes. Um, and, and, uh, and your mom is, is, um, is still alive today and obviously your brother too. As you yes, me. yeah. Um, and um, so, once you had to navigate the court system, um, I, I now want to get into how you met Lisa Smithcamp. So um, at one of the court hearings, uh, the defendant, um, now the defendant, uh, Dijon Baskin, came out into the courtroom shackled, and then Deputy District Attorney Lisa Smithcamp was there. You described her in a, in a bunch of different ways. Um, amazing force. Yes. Um, never looked scared and extremely confident. Yes. Those are the kinds of adjectives and ways to describe a prosecutor that everybody would want um, on their case. And you happen to get that's the very same prosecutor with Lisa Smithcamp. Yes. Um, and the other thing you were, you were talking about was how realistic um, Deputy District Attorney Smithcamp was that you, she, you said she was quote, um, not trying to sell me a dream and that she told you and kind of warned you uh, that the wheels of justice turned very slowly and how long of a process it was. And most importantly, you, you reminded me of how uh, Lisa said, uh, this is going to take a long time, and, but you have to keep on moving. You have to keep on moving for yes. yourself and for your daughter. Yes. Um, and what, what I found to be so striking um, about that was how Lisa was more concerned, as you said, um, for you and your mom and your brother as humans, as yes. opposed to witnesses. Yes. That Lisa was just as concerned, if not more concerned for all of you and your livelihoods um, than the case itself. Yes. And felt from the beginning 
uh, that you were going to be included in the process. Can you tell us a little bit about how Lisa empowered you as a, as a victim who was trying to navigate this foreign and really scary landscape? Yes. Well, I think you said it perfectly. Um, she never made us feel like we were a case number or, you know, somebody that we needed to further her case or, you know, get her a higher status. We were people, we were individuals, we were victims that, you know, had went through this traumatic experience and she was concerned with our well-being, not just, you know, and she, and she wanted to prosecute him obviously to get us justice and so I felt like she knew what she was doing I felt confident in her abilities but I also felt confident because she um, made sure that I knew about all the hearings I knew what they meant um, she went into details of explaining you know this is this type of you know this is a prelim or a pre-prelim or this is what they're asking for and so she walked me through the steps of everything and she was very honest with me. She told me this is going to take a very long time and you can't hold on to what you went through because you have to move on. You have to find a way to move on, be better, um, get help that you need for counseling and, and be able to provide and be there for your daughter. And so um, in my head as a victim, I'm thinking, no, I got to I got to relive this every single day until we go to trial. So I remember everything. And she said, you're going to forget things. And that's fine. She's like, but you need to you need to care about yourself and your family and make sure that you're taken care of. And so she knew I was in school. I was you know, still in the paralegal program. And she said, you know, continue on with that. Um, she was, you know, very encouraging, very smart and I never felt he, he had a defense attorney that was you know pushing certain buttons and and doing certain things and I never she shut it down <laughs> pretty much in my opinion um she was very confident she made sure that we were protected our information was protected that you know I I just felt safe with her and in that process she um was able to give me all the heads up on you know the the hearings and um, she connected we, me with victims advocates who were constantly checking in with me and my mom and and my brother and finding out you know if we had any other medical issues or concerns or you know if he had been trying to contact us for criminal protective orders. I mean, she just like went above and beyond. And and she um, always let you know that you were going to be included in every part of the process as much as you wanted to be. Yes. Um, and, um, it, and it, it just so happens that Marcy's law um, was first passed, the first state it passed in to ensure constitutional rights, enforceable and meaningful constitutional rights for victims was in the state of California. Yes. Um, and so you had all of the benefits of Marcy's law that, um, you know, Deputy District Attorney at the time, Smithcamp, um, lived and, and breathed as far as including victims in the process um, and made sure that you knew that those were not just rights, but constitutional rights of yours that empowered you. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. She was very um, informative in that way. Um, she let me know everything that, you know, I could do, couldn't do. She gave me information relating to, you know, whether or not um, I had to give a statement to his defense attorney. Um, and she told me, you know, you don't, you don't have to, you're not obligated to. So she gave me the tools that I didn't even know existed um, at the time. And so she um, informed me of everything that I had. She told me, you know, I'm, I'm here. You can be heard by the court. You can come to the hearings. You, you know, you can avoid coming to the hearings. It, it's completely up to you. But she said, you know, she gave me all the tools and all the information I needed. And she was very informative throughout the whole process. Um, and, and she was realistic too. So she would tell me, you know, this is delayed because of this. And she would let me know. And, and she's like, you know, so when something else comes up, I'll let you know. And, you know, just in the meantime, make sure you're, you're getting the services you need and, and you're okay. Yeah. And you talk with me a lot about how uh, her communication was so key and, and she always included you in all of the different communications. So you always felt like you were up to speed on, every single day, every single kind of hearing. And as you know now, as a prosecutor yourself, 
there are a lot of hearings. Yes. <laughs> Sadly enough that when you go into court, really not much substantive happens. Yeah. Um, and it can be frustrating, not just for the for the prosecutor involved or everyone involved, but also for the victims who want to see if they can actually get the case moving along. Um, so it, it, although sometimes these hearings may not seem like a big deal uh, to, to some, um, the fact that Lisa would bring you in and say, this is what's going to happen. And this is what I anticipate. And, and, you know, you can come and be in, as involved as you'd like, or, yes. um, and so that communication you relate to me really built the level of trust that you had yes. and developed with, um, with Lisa Smith camp. Now, obviously these trials go through, uh, take a long time and uh, they're traumatic in and of themselves. And, and you basically relate to the court um, what you, you were talking to me about the incident and, and other things as well. Um, and ultimately he was convicted in yes. September of 2012. I think he was sentenced to 75 or 77 years to life. Um, yes, 77 years to life. And, um, and, and, and Lisa afterwards, you, you guys had developed a relationship, um, obviously, because you become very close with the victims and the victims' families, and especially you and um, Deputy DA Smithcamp. Um, but then after it was all over, then Lisa said to you, as she was encouraging you all along the way, make sure you take care of yourself and, and your daughter. Um, she said, well, now that the case is over, um, I want to encourage you even more. I want to encourage you to make sure you go back to school and go to law school. And you told me that, that when you were a paralegal, you wanted to become a lawyer, that was your mm -hmm. dream, and yet you thought you actually wanted to be a prosecutor. And you said, after I met Lisa Smithcamp, I knew that not only did I want to be a prosecutor, I wanted to be a badass prosecutor. Like yes. Smithcamp. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so to talk a little bit about your career, um, you, you finished college, and I think it's uh, very important to note, too, that when we go back to what Dijon Baskin did to you in your relationship um, when you first got married and you said that he isolated you and shattered your confidence. Yes. And um, this, this case itself ended up turning into a confidence builder because of your relationship with the prosecutor in the case. And she built up your confidence. Yes. And encouraged you. <laughs> and so now with your newly gained or regained confidence, you did go back to college and then you went to law school. Yes. And I believe Lisa Smithcamp was at both your college graduation and law school <laughs> graduation. Yes. Yep. And, so. and, um, and, and, and after you passed, um, after you graduated from law school, as we all know, as lawyers, you then have to take the bar exam, which yes. is a grueling experience. <laughs> and you didn't pass the first time. Yes, that's correct. And a lot of people just say that I'm going to go into something else because it's yeah. just a grueling experience. But you took it again. Yes. And you didn't pass the second time. No, I actually I passed on my fourth time. <laughs> and you passed on your fourth time. Yes. And as 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 you and I talked about, um, a, a lot of times when you um, when you do things over and over, your chances of su success um, get better each time. But we all know the data with passing the bar exam uh, for those who haven't taken it. Um, the more you take the bar exam and, and fail, your chances of passing yeah. really decrease for a whole lot of reasons. Yes. Um, but you kept at it. Um, yes. So there's a little bit of a theme here when it comes to Rachel Baskin as far as <laughs> giving up and having grit. And so you pass the bar exam. Yes. And at some point during that time, Deputy District Attorney Lisa Smithcamp said, I'm going to run for Fresno County District Attorney. And two of her biggest campaigners were you and your mom. Yes. So that actually, um, she ended up running um, when I was still in my bachelor's program. Um, I had went back to school um, and her idea was to run for, for a district attorney um, for Fresno County. And me and my mom, we, you know, and my daughter, we all had the shirts. We were walking door to door. We were campaigning for her um, and just showing the level of, you know, compassion that we had for her and respect. Um, and so she ended up becoming the district attorney. And so during that process too, she still was like encouraging and telling me, continue school, go to law school once you get in. And I'm thinking, I can't do this. And, you know, so over, over the years, she would tell me, you know, we became friends and 
she would just always encourage me to, to do what I wanted to do. And um, she would just tell me that I had a, a gifted mind and memory and that I could do it. And so uh, one day I realized, you know, if the person who I look up to the most believes in me, then why don't I believe in myself? And so I went on, I went on to law school. And then after law school, of course, I'm like, oh, I didn't pass the bar the first time. So I'm never going to be an attorney. <laughs> And so, you know, she still continued to encourage me and she was really there for me. And she's like, you're going to get it. Um, you're, you know, it's just going to take time and, and you'll get it and you'll do this. And so after the second time, I'm like, no, now I really am not going to get it. And then the pandemic hit uh, when I took the third bar. So that was just a disaster in itself. It didn't count. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so I, I, at that point, I'm like, I had been studying for six months, you know, because they kept delaying it. And so I'm like, if I can't pass the one that I studied six months for and, you know, fundamentally knew everything, you know, that I didn't know before, I'm like, I, I just can't do it. And so she encouraged me and she's like, don't don't study <laughs> just take this next one and I had about when I found out I didn't pass the third time um I had about four weeks before the next bar and so I'm thinking that's insane you normally study for three months before you take the next exam so she was like just pay for it <laughs> take take it don't study you're you're in your head and you need to just get out of your head. So I went in there not expecting anything. I expected to do worse than I've ever done. And, but there was just this calmness about me when I took the fourth bar and I finished and I was like, well, I'm not crying on my drive home. <laughs> so I think, I think I might've, I'm, I either passed or I failed miserably, but you know, at that point it was, you know, no harm, no foul. I didn't even study for it. So I ended up, I found out that I passed the bar and that was just the best news that she had heard. And she's telling me, I knew it. I knew it. I felt it. I knew it. And she's like, so now you're going to come and work for me. <laughs> and <clears throat> you passed the bar in May of 2021. And it's an amazing story of how what someone can achieve if there's someone that they admire believes in them yes and i remember you saying uh, that, that that you said to lisa if you think i can do it then so do i yes and um so you passed the bar in may of 2021 and in september of 2021 you were sworn in as a deputy district attorney in yes. fresno county by <laughs> by attorney lisa, lisa Smith. Smith. <laughs> and um Somebody, a little girl, uh, pinned your prosecutor pin yes. on your lapel for you that day. And who, who was that? That was my daughter. Yep. She was there front, front row and center. <laughs> and there was just one other little um, story that I wanted to relay that um, was, was very, very heartwarming and just talks about um, how the relationship that District Attorney Smith Camp had with you and how, and, and how she just knew what you needed along the way. Yes. Um, you, you talked about when you rescued your daughter from her bedroom that day uh, when she was 18 months old and mm -hmm. all of the blood that was covering her. And she, you said that she also took her little blanket, which was a special blanket to her that one of your friends gave her and she had it and she loved it. And sadly it was covered in blood and actually became part of evidence in the case. Yes. Um, Tell us about that blanket and where it is right now. <laughs> so um, my my best friend gave me a blanket for her um, and she had it since I think she was maybe about five months old um, and she was attached to that blanket. That was her go to. Um, and so she actually had it on the, the day of the incident. And when I grabbed her from the crib, I grabbed her and I grabbed her blanket and I wrapped her in the blanket as I you know was running. Um, but it was covered in my blood and, you know, she was covered in my blood. So they ended up taking it into evidence. Um, and so a really weird request that I had for, for Lisa was, you know, I come up to her and I'm like, is there any way, you know, like what happened to this blanket? And so she went and she had either someone for her from her office or um, herself. And then she found out that it was actually in evidence. And I said, you know, is there any way that I can get it back? And she's like, why would you want a bloody blanket? You know, and I, I said, because my daughter is attached to it. And I, I felt like it was important to have her be comforted. And that was the blanket that comforted her. So 
um, I asked her, I said, is there any way you can get it back? So she ended up, she had to, I, I think she might have even had to file a motion with the court and she had to discuss it with the attorney on, you know, for him. And uh, they had to come to an agreement and there was, you know, they ended up taking photographs of, of the blanket and, you know, the blood stains and everything um, for evidence so they could keep that. And then she got an order from the court to release the blanket. So she ended up releasing it. Um, they, the police department let it go. And so, uh, my friend, um, my other friend had a really good sanitizing washer. So she washed it a few times and sanitized it and, and got all the blood out and she gave it back to me and I gave it to Layla and she still has that blanket to, to uh, today's day. <laughs> It's really it, just an incredible story. And so she now, um, that little girl is the one that we talked about in the very beginning. Yes. She's about to start her freshman year in high school. Yes. <laughs> and she still has her little blanket. Yes. And it's really an amazing story about a prosecutor and a relationship with a victim and having someone believe in themselves to take them to the heights that, that, that Lisa uh, took you to and to give you yes. the, the courage and the confidence to do all that you've done and an incredible story about a mom and a daughter. Yes. Um, ab absolutely amazing to see the, the bond that you had and the fact that you, when you talked about that room and you said, um, take me, if you wanna kill someone, kill me. You, you would, it, the, you, you described that scene where everyone said that they would, would, would give up their lives for each other. Um, it was so incredibly powerful and moving and I wish you the best of luck with uh, getting back to school and your incredible career as a prosecutor because you're now doing for victims and victims' families what was done for you and your family. Yes. Um, and it's amazing how you're able to pay it forward and it's really quite a blessing. Um, I'm confident that when you walk into a courtroom, there are people that say, I want to be a prosecutor like Rachel Baskin. And probably some people say, I want to be a badass process. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> so th thank you so much for, for joining us. Thank you for all thank that you. you do for victims. Why we do what we do is inspired by people like you. Thank you. Um, and prosecutors like you and everyone who fights for victims every single day. So thank, thank you so much and have a great year at school. Thank you. <laughs>